Hey folks, uh, today's video is a really important one and anyone who's been named the executor or administrator of an estate is really going to benefit from watching this. I'm going to cover the various team members that you'll need to settle an estate and also go over a few of the methods that you can use to perform some of these functions on your own. So many families that I speak with, they feel like they can handle everything on their own initially or at most with an attorney. And that's really fine if you start out like that, but at a bare minimum, I want to make sure that you're aware of those folks that you might need either now or in the future and what to look for in a solid professional. If you don't use care in selecting the right help, you might find yourself saving a dime just to lose a dollar. So without further ado, let's go ahead and review the top seven team members that can make this uh, whole process faster, easier, and honestly more lucrative for the family. So the first person I'll talk about is the one that everybody's going to think of first, and that's the attorney. Most people who feel that they need to hire counsel will usually ask themselves if they know any lawyers already. And this can be a valid approach for something like a, a landscaper, but most folks don't actually know an attorney who actively practices probate law. And believe it or not, a lot of people think that a lawyer is a lawyer is a lawyer, but just like you wouldn't take your boat to an auto mechanic, the same goes for you, an attorney and anybody else in your probate team in general. So does everyone administering an estate need an attorney? No. But should everyone consult an attorney? Yes. Look, you're going to need to know what common pitfalls may come up in the state and county where the probate was filed. And your situation might be more complicated than you originally thought it was. Every county across the USA has its own rule set with probate, and minor differences can make for dramatically different approaches. Knowledge is power, and in probate, knowledge is equity and inheritance saved. Okay, so other advantages to having an attorney are in the form of efficiencies and peace of mind. Um, one of the attorney's principal responsibilities is to coordinate the efforts of the team as a whole, at least as far as the legal filings and paperwork are concerned. Additionally, your lawyer can negotiate with creditors to reduce the total debt payments. And really, depending on your situation, that can sometimes save the estate more in reduced debt than the actual attorney fee. So that is a win no matter what. Uh, the accountant is going to be next up on the list of functions most administrators will want to outsource. So a CPA's main role is going to be in preparing the decedent's final tax return. But that is a personal tax return. They're also going to want to file or need to file the probate and trust estates as well. Um, an added benefit to working with a CPA is that they can also assist with understanding the tax implications of the income distribution and the property sales. So in my opinion, a CPA is a necessity 100% of the time, unless, of course, you as the administrator are a CPA yourself. All right, so that's the two team members that are going to be the most influential on the legal side of things. Let's go ahead and move to the nuts and bolts of handling the physical estate. And this is where most people feel that they can just roll up their sleeves and do it themselves. Uh, this is also where you should really pay attention because it's where you can lose the most equity from the inheritance. So uh, we'll talk about the appraiser first. Since you as the administrator are responsible for submitting an inventory of the estate, you'll need to know what value to place on those items. And I don't want to scare you here uh, because I know when you when you get an estate that you have to um, settle, there's a ton of items and you're not going to need to find specific values for general household goods like dishes and clothing, etc. Um, if there's real estate, an appraiser is going to be pretty much necessary, though, and mandatory. This prevents the property from being sold for too little, and that can result in angry heirs or lawsuits. Um, it can also um, reduce tax capital gain tax as well. Um, the appraiser, the, the, the new appraisal can, and that's assuming that the tax assessment is well below market value, which is often the case. If there are high value items in the personal property, such as expensive jewelry, you're going to want to get an accurate value for those items as well. And that goes for anything that's got an insurance policy on it already. The greater accuracy and transparency that you employ during this process, it can really save you a lot of headaches in the future. So while we're on the subject of real estate and personal property, you might find it helpful to use an estate sale company and clean out crew to get the real estate ready to sell, rent, or move into. 
Uh, these team members are often dismissed as additional costs that are unnecessary, but once again, they can actually pay for themselves uh, if you get the right one. So let's dive a little deeper into their roles and how they can save you money. So for the estate sale company, you know, a lot of people ask, well, why would I give an estate sale company 30% of the personal property proceeds when I can sell it all on my own? And I know that 30% is not a small sum if you've got a lot of quality goods in the personal property. And honestly, you know, it might not even be necessary if you've just got a house full of normal stuff. Your best move in that instance might very well be to just hold a yard sale and then donate or trash the rest. But I'll talk about that more uh, in a moment. But right now, let's assume that the estate does have a lot of nice furniture, collectibles, antiques, etc. In that instance, I'll just go ahead and tell you a true story and uh, kind of illustrate the value of a good estate sale crew. So my mother, she enjoys picking up random knickknacks at these sales. And one day I was kind of looking over some of the things that she picked up. And one of the items that I noticed was a small ornate metal cup. Well, when I looked at the bottom, I noticed that there was a Tiffany stamp. So I immediately got on the internet and start, started doing some research. I found out that it was worth a lot actually. And I sold it on eBay for $700 for her. Well, she only paid $4 for this thing. So I immediately went through the rest of the items that she bought and I found another item that sold for 350 and she only paid nine bucks for that. Well, it turns out that the estate sale was conducted by a couple of sweet old ladies who tagged everything with a price and they just sat at a table collecting cash and putting it in a cheap lock box. Well, they only charged a 20% commission and the family, honestly, they probably lost thousands of dollars due to improper pricing. And it was only two gals sitting at a, at a table who knows who pocketed what uh, in the back rooms of the house. So yeah, they only charge 20% commission, but at what cost? Had uh, the family gone with a more experienced professional company, the increased commission would have been well worth it. Not to mention that more items would have been sold due to the ability to accept credit cards and other forms of payment. And in addition, the good companies will often have more employees to keep theft at bay broom sweep the property once the sale's over and donate the items that don't sell if the family wants them to do that. So I'll just reiterate, choosing an estate sale company goes well beyond just looking at commission. Uh, next up would be the clean out crew. And this can vary from 10 people in a dumpster to one guy in a truck. It really just depends on the workload. This is one of those services that can be 100% mitigated by your own personal sweat equity and that of any family members or friends that you can wrangle to get the help. Uh, now, it's not easy to herd those friends and family uh, members together on a specific day to do this. And at the end, you just might find yourself feeling that the $500 to $1,000 saved wasn't worth it at all. Uh, if the deceased was a hoarder, well, don't even try that yourself. I'm telling you right now, it can be detrimental to both your physical and mental health. And uh, if you think that you're going to tackle this, just watch an episode of Hoarders. I'm pretty sure that you'll change your tune once you uh, watch one of those episodes, if you think that cleaning it out on your own is the way to go. So barring a hoarder home, if you do decide to tackle this on your own, there are ways to save time and money. And I'll just kind of go over an example of how to do that. So um, number one, you want to go ahead and get the heirs together and assign them a number. Just let the family members pick the items that they want. So let's just go with five heirs for this example. So you'll give them a number one through five. Starting with number one, they can each choose an item until you get to number five. And then number five is gonna immediately go again backwards to number one, and you'll repeat this process. It keeps it fair because the person who chose first will then choose last and so on. And then obviously large ticket items like cars and expensive jewelry or artwork, they may need to be left out of this process. They can be sold to the public or to an heir for a discount, unless everyone just happens to agree that somebody can have the item. So the second uh, part is once everyone's selected their keepsakes, the rest should be sold, donated, or trashed. If the estate doesn't contain a lot of nice furniture, et cetera, a yard sale might be the best course of action here. And uh, as for the items to donate, this has become a little bit more difficult during the age of COVID. So my suggestion is to schedule a pickup time on a sunny day and put the items on the lawn of the, uh, the day of the pickup. 
um, companies like Salvation Army and um, Goodwill, a lot of them aren't even coming into the home anymore, so this might be a necessity. Um, so now you should have a greatly reduced amount of stuff to deal with. So the third part of this is if you've got a ton of items remaining to be trashed, you can rent a dumpster that's going to be parked out front. You can just load everything in and then they'll haul that away. Uh, you can also place an ad on Craigslist and Facebook alerting folks that you've got free items for them to take. Um, once again, you're going to want to do the same thing. You're going to want to put everything out in the yard uh, for them to come and take the, the stuff. You don't want strangers coming into your house. Um, and um, hopefully you'll get the attention of a local junk hauler who will take a lot of it off your hands for free and really make uh, quick work of that for you. If the rest is just a truckload or two, making a few trips to the dump is going to be a lot cheaper than renting a dumpster. All right, so things are really moving now. The legal side's being handled by the attorney and the accountant. The real estate's cleaned out and ready for the next step, whatever that might be. So if you're like most families and you decide to sell the real estate, you really need to look into hiring a realtor with probate experience. I I'm, I'm want to reiterate that, with probate experience. The vast majority of the time, real estate is the most valuable asset in a probated estate. And if you just go with Aunt Sally or a friend of a friend, that is a really bad idea. Most realtors don't specialize in probate sales. And not only do they not know when the real estate is legally allowed to be sold, there are various things that they may do in their marketing efforts that can actually generate a lot of lowball offers instead of offers that are market value or higher. Also, a realtor with probate experience is likely to have connections that are pertinent to the process beyond just the title company and staging crew. And that can be anywhere from investors ready with cash offers to contractors who can make the necessary repairs so that the property sells at a much higher price and so on. Um, similar to the estate sale example, a good realtor with probate experience will pay for themselves much faster than a random friend with a license is likely to do even if that friend reduces their commission for you. A realtor who specializes in probate sales will also be a guide through the maze of regulations and compliance that's critical to the sale being finalized, and they'll help you avoid the potential stiff penalties that can be had by not conducting a sale properly. If you just put a for sale by owner sign in the yard, that is a great way to add months of holding costs to the mix and maybe get yourself in legal trouble, and you might find that it actually costs you more to try to sell the property on your own. So a good realtor is key. Um, lastly, we're uh, kind of nearing the end here. Um, the insurance agent is worth noting. Now, the insurance agent may actually be several people. For life insurance policies taken out on the deceased, the issuing agent's usually going to go ahead and complete the claim forms and handle that process for you for free if you request them to do that. So take advantage of that. Look, any free assistance that you can get that takes things off of your plate and puts them on a professional's is good assistance. Now for the real estate, if the property sits vacant for 30 days or more, you're gonna need a vacant home policy or the property is at risk of total loss. I wanna repeat that for you. Normal homeowner policies do not cover the property after 30 days of vacancy. It doesn't matter if you're still paying the bill or not. Now, incidentally, most probate attorneys don't bring this up and this is really important here. These policies are not the easiest to find and they're more expensive than a normal homeowner policy. So all the more reason to move quickly on the real estate. Uh, for personal property like automobiles, RVs, insured artwork, et cetera, you can just go ahead and pay the premiums as usual, uh, but you may be able to get a reduction on the auto insurance, especially if the vehicle is not being used. All right, so that's the top seven team members that you should consider when you're settling an estate. But everyone's situation is unique, and there are numerous other people that you might find you need. I'll just give a couple honorable mentions here. Uh, a good local banker uh, is really uh, helpful. You've got to open an estate, set, uh, an estate bank account. You might need to get a new mortgage on the property. Uh, you might need to get um, repayment uh, extended, and so on and so forth. So having a relationship with a local banker is a good thing to do. Uh, various bureaucrats are, are going to be people that you work with um, uh, at the DMV, at the uh, clerk of court, etc. Contractors, handymen, stockbrokers, on and on it goes. 
So if you want to make sure that you get the best help so that you can save the most time and money, sites like Angie's List or looking at Google reviews can be helpful, but they can also be manipulated. So your best option is going to be to ask a local professional like myself, and they can connect you to the resources you need. As always, even if you aren't in the Northern Virginia, D.C. area, I am happy to help. Um, I can connect you with someone in my network across the country who can connect the dots and make this easier. Um, but, uh, you know, just take your time and ask the right people and make sure that you plug the right people into the job so that uh, this is all behind you and you don't have regrets at the end of the day. Until next time, I wish you the absolute best and Godspeed as you put all this behind you.